Welcome to the penultimate episode of the season of Beyond the Paradox, where we explore a future that prioritizes our individual and collective power of choice. In part four, AI innovator Alex Sado showed us that regardless of what Hollywood sci-fi narratives might suggest, there are countless examples of how artificial intelligence is being used to create a sustainable future for all. In this discussion, we learn how narrative shapes the world we live in with philosopher and post-humanist, Professor Francesca Ferrando. She reminds us that exercising our power of choice when it comes to the quality of what we see on TV can affect the very fabric of society. Francesca. Stay with me. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to look okay. at a lot of the notes I made because there's so much to talk about. And I had to write notes so that I can stick by them. Otherwise, I'm going to go outside of those frameworks. I mean, to me, everything it is that you do is a podcast conversation. So I have to be very, very high level about this. Uh, Before we launch into understanding the difference between post-humanism and transhumanism, the listeners are going to be so proud of their vocabulary when we're done. (laughs) Uh, I want to give them a sense of you. Francesca Ferrando, doctor, professor, futurist, concerned with humanity's existential wellness, ensuring that we don't devolve during the next 15 to 20 year window that lies ahead. So I'm not going to do that by introducing any of your many accolades up front. We'll get to that on the timeline. But what I do do is to give the listeners a sense of who you are, of your characters. I use pop culture references that they might be familiar with. So it's a bit of a shortcut. (laughs) <laughs> and I do this, so we play this game where my guests give me actors who they would cast as their child and adult selves in the movie biopic of their life story. And when I asked you, you <laughs> said Sophia the Robot. Yes. So, <laughs> I'm sure that the irony of that answer will hit like a slow release wave as the discussion progresses. But this did pose a challenge for me because and I didn't experience with my other guests. But I ended up with a few choices to play adult Francesca and young Francesca. And I hope I covered all my bases. <laughs> yeah. Correct me if I'm wrong at any time. So young Francesca, I've cast as Kaylee Fleming. And she plays Rick Grimes' daughter in The Walking Dead, Judith Grimes. So she's born in a zombie apocalypse. She's smart as a whip, innocent, but quite the sword ninja. When the chips are down, she's able to wipe out any walker that comes her way. Also, she's non-judgmental. She treats everyone except zombies as equals, even the criminal Negan. So I'm not sure if I'm close on that one. That's beautiful. That's really the, <laughs> the most important uh, word that we need to do on ourselves in, in order to really connect to existence as a complete open frame that we are and is uh, being non-judgmental. And uh, I think it's easy when we are young, so it's inter- interesting that you connected it to a younger person. And then when you go on in life, you think that maybe you found some type of um, meaning and some type of truth. This apply to everyone. And then you start maybe judging other people based on your criteria. And that's, I think, when you really get out of the chance of really, you know, the Buddhist or the Hinduists call enlightenment, you know, in philosophy, you, it would be called full awareness. But that's when you really cut yourself from that, uh, that option of, of, of really connecting to everything, which I think it may be the, the, the most important thing we can do in our life. And I've been very aware of that. And aware that, uh, you know, like I, it's true that there is uh, definitely my nature is, is, the nature of curiosity, and I think all of our nature, the, you know, the child who is really not judgmental because they have not learned yet what society values, what society doesn't value. And then the more we, you know, grow, and it's not age, it's more, I think, uh, on one side, maybe becoming part of a society, being socialized, and on the other side, creating who you think you want to be, so your own values and your own criteria to connect with others, which is also natural because obviously, you, you are going to connect with others who share your same interests for many different reasons. But then, and that's, 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 that's a good thing, but then the risk of that is starting to judge in others because they are not following your own criteria. 
and I've been actually really thinking of this these days because I, as I was mentioning before we started our conversation, so we're talking during the coronavirus outbreak on planet Earth, I can say at this point, it's a pandemic, 2020, and there is a lot of suffering and a lot of challenging experiences that this has brought into our lives. But there is also a very precious gift, which is really the, the connection to, to our existence and, 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 and the, the understanding that this existence is always changing and it, it does end in the way that we are uh, aware of. And in this sense, I'm really being uh, um, even more aware of the fact that uh, that layer of even uh, like light uh, judgment uh, about others really need to be completely dismantled to be really be able to be connecting to everything and everyone. And of course, I'm not talking only about the humans. I'm talking also about non-humans and technology and all these other things. So I'm glad that you mentioned, you know, the aspect of being non-judgmental because it's something that it's, it's, I think it's a work in progress and it doesn't come with existence, but I think it comes with socialization and creating our own individual perspectives and, and, and values. Yeah, it is definitely something that's not easy to do. Uh, it's just something I sensed very naturally innate in you. And, and then I thought early 20s, I was thinking maybe Daisy Ridley could kind of sink her teeth into playing you with this phase because she's determined that focused ray in Star Wars, you know, The Force Awakens, The Last Jedi, The Rise of Skywalker, because like her, there's something you're fighting in this way. And it's not physical. But the energy and acuteness of the warrior is the same required intensity. So, okay, so you're in your late teens, early 20s. This is maybe, maybe I'm skipping a little ahead because you said you did spend some time in South Africa. But when did you feel this, the force awaken, if, if I may, pulling you into this current field of interest where you are? Was it when you graduated in classical studies or was it before? Thank you so much. So I'm... I am very grateful to many people. Uh, some are alive, uh, some are not, and some I never met in person. And one of these people is uh, Friedrich Nietzsche. And when I was um, 16, 16 and a half, 17 year old, I had the, the fortune to actually study Nietzsche in school and, uh, and to study uh, Zarathustra. And um, I really learned a big lesson which was the idea of um, trying to play this game with your own life to see if you're, li if you're living the life that you should be living for your own values, for no one else than yourself. And this is a very simple game that I really um, always advise people who are struggling with decisions or my students to use in their life if they want, because it's been very useful in my life. And it's uh, the, um, playing a game, a thought experiment, and it's the eternal recurrence. So if you could, uh, if you were going to live your life exactly the same forever and ever, and in Nietzsche mean exactly the same, like nothing different, every person that you ever met, every food that you ever eaten, every action and thought and dream that you ever had, so absolutely nothing different, would you say yes to this kind of life? And that uh, question struck me as a young person. And I remember asking some older people and people who were very happy with their life, they were excited about this thought experiment. And people who were uh, not happy with their life, this thought experiment was so uh, uh, hard on them, they would have to stop even proposing them to try to play this game. And to me, it really allowed me to understand that uh, my life was my greatest work of art and uh, there was no one to judge them for myself. And at first that meant... Uh, traveling when I was a teenager. I started to travel in many different ways. I was curious about humanity in, in, in its whole uh, diversity, uh, with all these different classes and ethnicities and nationalities and genders and experiences. I was really curious. Like you said very well at the beginning, like really in a non-judgmental way, or maybe I was maybe more judgmental of, uh, of the rules that we were supposed to follow. So I was very influenced, for instance, by anarchism and surrealism and uh, all these uh, kind of avant-garde uh, movements. So it, all that uh, pushed me, like you said, to um, consider myself a little bit of, the re of a rebel, of uh, no normativity, uh, not of every norm, but to the norms that or I wouldn't uh, agree with. Uh, for instance, gender. I really saw very 
early that uh, there was a big gap that uh, didn't make sense to me and there was a lot of in inequality and inequity. So that one was very clear to me at a very young age, although I didn't have a language for that. Academia helped me learning how to express this uh, feeling of uh, at first anger, I would say, towards specific uh, patterns in society. Uh, also that side of um, the joyful anarchist rebellion. So it was not an angry rebellion that was uh, misery. It was a lot of fun. You, you know, like see what you need to see and, and be honest to yourself and, what to, and to what you see. Um, and that for me was the most important thing to see every aspect of existence. Moving on from Ray, now the force is awakened and I want to introduce the actress that I chose to cover my basis to casting adult Francesca. And I'm, I was imagining you earning your, your, your bachelor's and your master's in literature and philosophy. A combination of, and play with me, Audrey Tattoo, particularly in Amelie, a little fae out of this world, a character described as one who decides to change the lives of those around her for the better while struggling with their isolation. I think maybe I should pause for you to speak to that before I move on to the next one, because that could end up being a little bit loaded. Yeah, that's a really nice movie. It's a, it's a joyful movie. Uh, I did enjoy it. I'm, um, I must say that I rarely find the movies that I really like, because a lot of movies repeat stories that I do not share, and I never shared in my life. And I think one of the reasons why I, I am alive, uh, it's really to to maybe to speak about the fact that those are not the only stories possible. And there are many other sp stories that have been told or that also have not been told uh, yet, uh, or maybe that have been told and we have forgot. Uh, so I think that um, the movie that you uh, mentioned, Emily, is a definitely different movie, a movie that I did enjoy. And again, I must say that it's rare that I enjoy a movie because unfortunately I am I already kind of know what's going to happen within the first five minutes because a lot of the stories are the same story. So I think that uh, it's an interesting movie that you mentioned because it's definitely a movie that uh, I appreciate it. And uh, it, it's, it's, it's different. It's, uh, the message is different. Um, and it's much more real because most people are not here to kill you or, or rape you or, or, or take everything from you and destroy your soul that no one can do it anyway. But most people, if you are going to be in trouble, most people are going to give you a hand, uh, their hand, you know? So I think that uh, this movie is much more realistic than many of the movies that are portrayed as, you know, like these uh, realities in which, you know, the, 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 the bad, usually guy, put men, you know, they have to deal with so terrible stories about their own gender. And I used to be very angry as a female. Now, now I'm not angry anymore, but now I am compassionate towards being men because the men in this uh, century uh, have a lot to deconstruct because really they need to really create new stories, new uh, imageries for, for themselves. Because uh, since a very young age, they are given uh, guns to play with. And, uh, you know, the idea of like a young child killing uh, militaries when they're two years old. And that memories are going to be with this child for the rest of their life. So I think that as a society, we really have a lot, work, a lot of work to do. Uh, maybe at one point, some societies thought that war was a good idea. We now know that it's not a good idea. And the fact that we are still repeating these kind of stories on very young minds, it's uh, something that we, we should be probably ashamed about. And uh, I'm a mother as well now, and I see how young children are given information that are really deleterious for their own uh, psyche. So I think that now coming from gender is definitely not anymore just about uh, how women are, uh, you know, consider uh, um, the, the object of uh, many different sexist approaches, but really also as men are being uh, the objects of many sexist approaches from, the, from another per perspective. And it's really hard on them too. So now I feel that um, intellectual activity is very important, but uh, we really need to understand that we are forces and energies and the way we are delivering the message is also the message itself. So now, um, I, I, I can't wait to almost fast forward to the point where, where I get you to, to just break down uh, both of the, of the components. But, um, but before that, and, and this, is, this is sort of due to your, I would say, that there, is, there is such layered complexity in you. Uh, and what it is that you that you bring to the world. I, I, I don't often, well, I'm not saying I, I, not that I don't often think of this, but there's a flip side saying to 
the, the present is a gift to you, uh, you know, that whole gift being a present. We don't often flip that around and think, you know, maybe we are the gift to the present. And I very much, when I think of you, I think of that you are a gift to the present. And there's there, these different components of you. <laughs> and I really want to get to, I want to get to the meaty part of the conversation, but I, I honestly feel that if I don't, if I don't unpack these layers of, of you, about you, that I'm, I'm not going to be doing full justice to, to creating the container in which to, to have this conversation. So thank you for your patience with this. Um, Jenny, thank you so much. I just want to tell you that you are extremely kind with your words and they do really mean a lot to me. And I want to thank you so much for being so generous. So where, where you were talking about the, the focus around, just, just around, you know, there, there's this humanitarian perspective. There's this element that is required to bring that into the world. And, and I had, and, and I'm not quite sure why, but I had Alicia Vikander. Now don't laugh, I know. She did the role of Ava in Ex Machina. And I don't know if you watched that movie. I did. Okay, so I was thinking if, if you imagine her playing Sarah Connor in, in the Sarah Connor Chronicles or um, in the first Terminator, if her in that is probably a better reflection, I would imagine. If she did that, then she would be able to, to pull this off. Because now here I can picture the scene where she's playing you earning your master's degree in gender studies. And this is where you meet Professor Rosie Bradotti, which must have been quite a formative time. So signaling the beginning of your championing of, of post-human philosophy. Yeah, I actually had, um, again, I don't know if it was like the luck or uh, the gift of meeting Rosie in Italy. Uh, it was like the year before I went for the master, uh, master degree. I really have to thank Rosie uh, for the fact of being uh, de defining and being a philosopher myself because when I saw her, and she was fun and full of energy and, and clear and, and strong and, um, and beautiful and passionate, respectful and, um, and kind and just. And, uh, and she was a philosopher. And until then, I truly only studied male philosophers and only met male philosophers. And I saw myself more as a writer. For me, philosophy was, uh, was very male on one side. And when I saw her, I realized... I, I, I can be a philosopher, I can be an academic. Academics don't have to be boring, don't have to look gray and, 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 and be, you know, like all these other things. She was different. And, uh, and so really one of the reasons why I realized that I, that was a path for me as well, it was when I saw her, you know. I, I, she was not the type of academic that, uh, that, you know, you would expect in academia. But definitely, yeah, she was definitely one of those uh, big influences that uh, really reshaped some of the terms in my mind. And uh, so after seeing her and meeting her, I was like, I, I need to study with her. And then I, I applied for a scholarship. I got it. I went to the Netherlands. And again, also those, uh, I was 22 years old. It was also one of those, those formative years. I was studying gender and I was also living my life in that friend we were talking, you know. I was also playing the subway, my saxophone and meeting, you know, very interesting people uh, that were connecting to environmentalism and politics. And uh, so it was really an amazing year um, intellectually, but also existentially. Not to detract from that point in, in your life, obviously that was, that was quite a formative as you said you use the word saxophone i was thinking that's interesting because then you earn your doctorate in philosophy i was thinking marion cotillard because she she has this level of intellectual complexity which you see in inception and then she calls she does edith piaf in la vie and rose so she's got this range and versatility and and, and there's this you the musician because <laughs> i saw you on facebook with all sorts of instruments <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and that's uh, something that I think it's, it kind of got a little lost in the history of academia and um, in, in the history of intellectuals. And um, maybe now with this new situation, things are going to change. But I think that in the last 200 years, people got really pushed to specialize. So let's say that if you did something, that's all you did for the rest of your life. And it was 
not like that for many centuries and many societies. And of course, one simple example to bring is the Renaissance, which is always considered as, you know, um, highlights in human history, which was that these people were not just intellectuals. They were artists and musicians and, and you name it. They were, they were doing it all. And, and this, of, co of course, applied to many other types of Renaissance, the Harlem Renaissance and so on. And I always felt that way. I always felt that uh, it's really hard to push someone in, uh, in a cage and say, okay, this is the scientist, this is the intellectual, and this is the philosopher and painter. All those people who influenced my life, and I'm not on, only talking about people who I met, but also people, again, that I did not meet, but I studied about, were people who really played with so many di different sides of themselves. And I think that um, this has been very clear to me from the very beginning. I, I'm not just one thing. I'm the rainbow. And the rainbow is made of all the colors. And of course, if people just want to see one color in the rainbow, they can see that. But for me to act like I am only the color of the rainbow, it would be wrong because it would go against my nature. I'm not that. And I'm, now as an academic, I, of course, I, I try to just underline my philosophical side uh, because uh, it's what people expect. But I think it's, uh, it's, it's something that eventually this era is going to end and is going to flourish into maybe a posthuman renaissance in which we don't have to hide the fact that we are not just one thing. Uh, so I'm really passionate about the fact that, uh, although of course I, if I'm working, I'm just giving one side of myself because it's uh, what people expect and it's fine, but people should never forget that we are not just one thing, we are many things. And, and also, we are uh, existing beings. So we have all these big questions that also we cannot forget. And going back to the, niche, you know, the, 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 the beginning of our conversation, it's a good time now to really not forget those questions. And I think even in the post-human uh, debate, we kind of got a little lost before the coronavirus with you know, intellectual games. And there is no space for intellectual games when you know that you or someone who love may die tomorrow, you know? So posthumans need to really help us navigate through existence and enhance our existence. And I'm definitely not talking just about human enhancement in the biological sense as the transhumanists do, but I'm really talking about a philosophy that enhances the way you perceive existence, help you navigate. And those are the philosophy that can help you. And for me, this was, for instance, Nietzsche and, and, and feminism and posthumanism. But then with this crisis, I really rethought about where we were as a posthuman community. And I realized that I think we need to really understand that um, sometimes we can get lost as philosophers, as academics, as intellectuals in the intellectual game where we think that we have an infinite amount of time and we are, you know, like uh, immortal and all these things, uh, which, is, which are not true anyway, because everything eventually ends and transforms. So in, the, in this sense, I think that um, as a community, we, we really need to really refocus on what posthumanism is bringing to humans and not only. Uh, why is it precious? And I do think that costume is very precious, but it's not just a simple game of, of, uh, of terminology. The complexity and, and the different layers and, and you expressing so many different aspects of yourself makes me understand why it has taken so long to get to the point where we actually discuss these two elements. <laughs> because there's, there's so many different of these aspects that you've, you've expressed and lived into, which makes sense. And I'm thinking, I, I wasn't going crazy. Just, I couldn't, I had to build this picture because the last element I had of it was, was Keisha Castle Hughes, who plays Young Pi in Whale Rider and Queen Apelane in, in Star Wars uh, in the episode three, Revenge of the Sith. Virgin Mary in the Nativity Story. And in Game of Thrones Season 5, she's the eldest child of Prince Oberon Martell, Obara Sand, formidable warrior. And I just, I imagine seeing her playing you behind the scenes in that shot where you're producing your online courses and lectures. As I can actually see, I can actually see her going there, you know, digging really deep and playing literally the role of her life <laughs> to do that. So. So, so here you, you were visiting scholar at Columbia and then an, an independent researcher at the University of Reading. You're working on cyborg theory with Professor Kevin Warwick. Uh, when was this? So I, I came to the U.S. to be, uh, I was in fact a visiting scholar at the Department of Philosophy, Columbia University, New York City. And then I was also accepted as, uh, with, to work with Professor uh, Kevin Warwick, who is uh, very well known because he's considered the first human cyborg. He's the first human being 
who inserted a microchip inside of his own body. So I went uh, to, to study and work with him in 2009, and I was working specifically on gender and artificial intelligence. So that was, you know, an incredible time. Uh, it really, yeah, Kevin was another of those people, like, like Rosie on some level, because uh, for me, it's not just uh, working with someone who does incredible things. It's also working with someone that I can connect with and that I respect as a human being. And uh, so before actually writing him to ask to, to, to go and, and work with him, I, I went to a conference. I wanted to make sure that he was the right person. And at the time I was uh, based in Rome, I won a scholarship for my PhD, for my PhD in uh, theory and, uh, philosophy and theory of human sciences at the University of Roma 3. And he was giving a lecture in Vienna and I went there, and um, the lecture was amazing. But also, after the lecture, I, I introduced myself, and I had some chat, and I, I, I realized that he was the right person, that he's, he was the one. Uh, he was uh, not only a very interesting scientist, uh, but also someone that uh, could think in philosophical terms, social terms, and he was, uh, he was also a kind soul, you know. To me, it's very important. It was really an exceptional time, so... Sounds like that's almost a, that's a podcast conversation in its own. <laughs> in your book, Philosophical Post-Humanism, you explain the difference between transhumanism and post-human philosophy. Can you give us the bit of the background on this, including the three components that comprise the post-human philosophical element? So just so listeners don't feel too overwhelmed, we'll clarify this using the sci-fi movie references later to make it clearer. So they can just hang in there. It'll be worth it. <laughs> yes. All right. So uh, the, um, I would say, like, um, let's start with a big um, philosophical frame. And again, when I'm talking about philosophy, I'm really not just talking about academia. Absolutely not. I always tell that every single human being, and probably not only human beings, but I'm referring to human beings because I can prove that, ask at least once in their life. And usually these questions start very early, uh, probably when they are as early as two and as later as eight. In, in, that, in those six years, uh, every human being at one point asks why. Why? Why is this like that? Why am I here? What is this? And the answers that they get, because they usually don't ask this question just to themselves, they usually ask a parent or a, or a professor or a teacher or a friend or someone, Usually the answer that they, that they get, it may be uh, an answer that is based on scientific grounds or religious grounds or um, social grounds, uh, cultural grounds or whatever. But that's not the point. I'm not going into the answer. The answers are multiple, Mul mo many different answers you can give to the question, why am I here? Or why are we here? What is this? But th the point as a philosopher is that you have at one point in your life asked that question. This is philosophy. This is the love of wisdom. Some people like to reverse it, the wisdom of love. Philos means uh, love, and uh, Sophia means wisdom. Classically, it would be the love for wisdom, but some people like to reverse it and say the wisdom of love. Now, um, the, the love for wisdom uh, simply means that you love asking a question and being brave enough to leave that question open. So it's not so much about uh, some type of philosophies. For instance, analytic philosophy is all about giving answers. Other philosophy, like the Socratic uh, method, for instance, uh, and also con continental philosophy, is really not so much about necessarily giving an answer, uh, but really trying to delve and also to be comfortable with the questioning process. So being able and comfortable to ask a question and also being comfortable enough to know that you may not be able to answer to that question. Now, um, so everyone has been, is a philosopher and has been a philosopher. So that's, uh, for me, it's uh, very important. Eh? So we're not just talking about an academic audience, we're, we're really talking to everyone here. Second point I want to make is uh, uh, what is the posthuman so that I can also answer to your question of post and transhumanism. So posthuman is a frame, what I'm trying to say, uh, the most precious, I think, uh, message here is that in the 21st century, a bunch of people, so it's definitely not just one person, but a, a bunch of different groups of people are uh, realizing that the term human may not be comprehensive enough to really refer, first of all, to all the human beings that we are, and also to 
the human beings that we are going to become right now in the close future and in the far future. What, why is that? Well, some people, and this is more connected to post-humanism, and I'm saying this because when I mentioned before that there are many groups of people that are not so comfortable anymore with the term human, I really mean that. I mean that there are many groups of people that sometimes are not even in agreement with each other. So this is why there are many different terms that are related to a one umbrella term. So when you say post-human, you really need to think of that as a, an umbrella term that is connecting and referred to from different uh, people, uh, thinkers, philosophers, artists, scientists, uh, etc., etc., who may not agree with each other, but who agree that the term human may not be comprehensive enough anymore. So let's see why. Uh, according to post-humanist people, uh, philosophers and, 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 and people associated with post-humanism, first of all, many people have never been considered human. And this is very true uh, historically. If you look at many uh, types of discriminations, for instance, if you think of slavery, if you think of the history, for instance, of apartheid in South Africa, if you think of history of sexism with women, uh, even, uh, you know, back to the Greeks, uh, back to the Greeks, uh, uh, philosophers were pretty much men, eh? <laughs> Sexu- like uh, um, biological men. Uh, even someone like Aristotle uh, really defined women as uh, less than men, uh, passive, emotional, uh, much more connected to uh, non-human animals than to human animals. So you can see many histories of people who uh, have not been humanized. And in order to be humanized, this meant uh, violence and, uh, and coercion and, uh, and laws and uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of obstacles to be considered human. So I would say that once, you know, uh, cities were cre- or, or settlements were created, uh, agriculture with the Neolithic time, we can start to see the creation of, of the other. Now you have your, 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 your town, your, your area with your crops. You want to uh, safe, safeguard that area. And then you create an imaginary border against others. And then the other becomes the barbarian, becomes the, 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 the violent one who wants to come and, uh, and, and, and steal your stuff and, and get your crops, etc. Et so all of this to say that, again, the history of the human is definitely a complex one. And it's really not correct to say that every human being has been considered as such. For instance, transhumanists uh, are saying that uh, uh, biotechnologies and uh, emerging technologies are really pushing the border of uh, uh, what we know as human. For instance, if someone could live 1,000 years, is that human? Because historically, that we know of, there are stories in mythologies and in religious narratives that humans could live a long time, longer than any other human we know of. But we don't have a, a historical proof of, of that. You also speak of the danger of narratives that separate Earth and humanity. Yeah, so we are in a time where we really need to change our narratives and it can only help us. And I think that one of the catastrophic uh, um, results of anthropocentrism is what we are witnessing right now. I think that on one side, uh, of course, it's connecting to the Anthropocene and six mass extinction and, um, and all these related problems that are connected to you know, seeing the human species at, at the top of a hierarchy in which non-human others and the biosphere is separated from us. But on the other side, we are really part of a, of a larger interconnected uh, community, a bio, te- biological community and also technological one. I'm not just, it's not, this is not just a call to, you know, return to the roots, is uh, understanding that we are part of the earth. Uh, but this is why I think posthumanism is so interesting, because it's not just about giving you a nice, clear answer to who we are, but it's really pushing you to rethink your own identity in open ways, rethinking of yourself in, in open, extended ways through, you know, the human species and technology and planet earth and the cosmos and and the planets out there, and the satellites that allow our co- conversation right now. Uh, so again, it's really, really rethinking of all the interaction of all these different elements, and it's not, this should not overwhelm, overwhelm you, but really understanding, understanding you that you are not just yourself. The narrative aspect of that is interesting, and how is that 
we make those connections as humans, how we understand the world that we live in, it is actually a little scary when you realize how much pop culture influences that. Because when I invited you as a guest, now I asked you if you enjoyed talking about pop culture narratives in this context, you sent me a chapter uh, you wrote entitled of post-human born, gender, utopia, and the post-human from the handbook on post-humanism in film and television. And I nearly died. But the reason I'm having these conversations is the fact that humans have no practicable future scenarios that were collectively created. Other than fantastical dystopian, dare I say, maybe limited to, to the transhuman versions in Hollywood. And in the paper, you explain how certain cinematic and television production seeds futures that fall into discriminatory normative codes. Yeah, so first of all, I want again to thank you so much for bringing this topic to the posthuman conversation, which is a narrative storytelling. And I'm really extra passionate about this because uh, I'm really realizing more and more in my life, instead of less, how much we are constructing realities based on narratives that already been placed without even being aware of. So I am, I'm getting even more aware of the fact that uh, a lot of the historical issues that we're seeing are just repetitions. Repetitions of things that are given as granted. And this given for granted is the most dangerous thing we can do as a species, as societies. We need to be brave. And the brave ones are the ones who do not take anything for granted, who can see Anything say, you know, it does not to have to be that way. Nothing has to be that way. Nothing, absolutely nothing. And in this sense, uh, uh, movies, most of them, especially the ones that get funded, because unfortunately a lot of very good movies are not getting any uh, funding. Um, the, the movies that get funded are usually repeating the same stories. And I had this, I had this uh, conversation when I was much younger, when I was a, a student in, in, at the University of Turin, and a very famous journalist in Italy came to give a lecture. And she was, you know, talking about what uh, news uh, do. And I asked, uh, uh, how do you choose the news? Uh, because the same, you seem to give the same news over and over, year after year, just changing the names of people. And she said, we give the news that people want to hear. And I asked, well, how do you know what people want to hear? And she had no answer to that. And I think that uh, a lot of these... Uh, misunderstanding come from a, a false, uh, um, comfortable place where you think that you know what other people want. And this is, again, a, a very good criticism that come from post-colonial studies and feminism and, and, and the black criticism, say, how do you know what women do? Uh, first of all, of course, who are women, but how can, uh, in history, there is these tendencies of other groups constantly saying what others want? And in this sense, I'm tired of hearing, you know, for instance, the media say, oh, we just give people what they want to have. Or, you know, the Hollywood stories, we just put out the movies that people want to watch. It's not true. People are not watching what they want to watch. They are watching what's easy to watch. So I think that the medias have a huge responsibility, but not only medias. I'm not only talking about medias, about storytellers and, and theaters and, 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 and people who write um, script for, uh, you know, poet, poets and every kind of cultural type of creation has a huge political role. Uh, this is why we are at the point where we need to come with new mythologies, mythologies that are brave and can tell a real story. And the story of you know, the male hero killing everyone to, 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 to gain the access to a female body is old, it's not wanted anymore. So instead of making money out of those movies, they are actually probably losing a lot of credibility. But I think that it's time uh, because there is not enough material out there for people to see things differently. And unfortunately, I still see now, 2020, the same stories that I saw as a teenager that it was so disenchanted with the media. But we need, need people to be brave and say, you know what? It's not true that if you're not creating the same stories, you're not going to make money. Probably you're going to make more money. And it's not, a money, it's not about money anyway. But if you put it that way, yes, you can make money creating new stories and being faithful to existence. Because your visions and your thoughts and your... Uh, Characters and your movies are shaping people's consciousness. It's a big political and existential responsibility. It's not just entertainment. I'm going to quote you again. You say science fiction can indeed offer insights and inspiration, 
but its contributions are far from innocent. And you have proof of this. You speak of the science fiction writer William Gibson's novel, and then you refer that back to, to Kevin Warwick. Yeah, it's very interesting that, you know, some people say, oh, I'm just entertaining people. And what we were saying is that entertainment is not only absolutely not just about entertainment, because again, you're really shaping people's fantasies and people's narrative about their own stories and how people see themselves. But it's also how you're, for instance, influencing uh, scientists. And for instance, uh, Kevin Warwick uh, told me that he got a whole idea about inserting a microchip in his body from a science fiction book. So what we're trying to say here is that uh, there is no such thing as, uh, you know, like uh, entertainment. And uh, it's also very important to really think of these, not just, uh, for, for instance, uh, uh, related to media, but really everything, all kind of uh, cultural activities. So it's, uh, um, look, uh, even a sexist type of education doesn't help anyone. Uh, when you have someone who is living in, in a society that is uh, unfair to some people, uh, that society is a, not a good society to live. And it's interesting when you study the history of slavery, for instance, many countries you could study that because it's very ancient practice, unfortunately. But for instance, if you study the history of the United States, uh, States what has been very well recorded, uh, you can see, of course, the side of the slaves. But then you can also look at the other side. And these people were constantly threatened to, to be poisoned, to be killed. They were living in a state of fear their whole life. For what? To have some free labor? and to treat other people, you know, as in, in miserable ways. And it's interesting, you know, talking about technology, that uh, uh, there are studies that show that the way people start to use, for instance, Alexa, uh, for instance, they have this uh, very good study about uh, young children and how uh, a young children who has a parent, for instance, who uh, uh, talk to Alexa, which is the uh, Amazon smartphone, in a, a derogatory way or in an unkind way, in an aggressive way, they learn this kind of narrative and expression and uh, behavior, and they use it outside of their relation with Alexa. They use it with teachers and friends and parents. So it's very important to say, you know, uh, going beyond the dualistic approach of I can, use, I, I can treat someone badly and I can treat someone in a good way. Who we treat is creating who we are. And if we are treating others in such miserable ways, but it's very important to try to understand it how we treat others, they can be technology, they can be humans, they can be non-humans, is really forming who we are and what we think we can do. What I'm trying to say is we really need to take this uh, to the existential core and understanding that our relation to the planet and our relation to the human species and our relation to technology, it's creating who we are in physical ways and intellectual ways and psychological ways and physical it's also important, we cannot uh, pollute the planet and expect it to have a healthy life. Uh, we were, now maybe with, with the COVID-19, a lot of um, ecological uh, situations are actually getting a little better because humans are moving less. But we were at the point of ecological catastrophe. So there is no separation between us and the others. And others not uh, as a capitalized other. Uh, I'm referring to what we, I was mentioning before, but others everything around us and, and us who are constantly others who are constantly changing. So I like to think of existence in material sense also as an ocean, as a, as an ocean which you have so many different, different layers, but everything is really connected. So it's very important really to, to get deeply merged in all the extensions of what it means to be human. And that brings us to the realization that probably what it means to be human is already to be post-human. In the sense that we are not just, we've never been just human. And that we're all constantly changing. And, and we are in this together. Uh, and as also as Rosie brightly said, we're all different. So yes, we are in this together, but existence is constantly shifting and uh, evolution is constantly changing. And this is why we are alive. So um, yeah, I think it's, uh, it's definitely a very exciting field to be connected to. And it, can really bring a lot of insights to your topic of narratives. It's ironic that you point out what the term robot means. Incredibly ironic. Yeah. So yeah, to, for the people who are not aware, a robot come from Czech and is connected to the meaning of slave. 
exactly uh, me or slave. Uh, so yeah, it's interesting because it's almost like uh, we are creating those, that fulfilling prophecy, you know, that is, uh, you know, the robots are going to take over and this whole fear about AI taking over. And I think that it's, um, it's itself, the fear, I think it's uh, completely, is another illusion once uh, we cannot use so much the, because of gender politics, we can use, not use so much, you know, others like women, for instance, as the inferior. Now it's okay to think of uh, robots as slaves. So now it's not a woman who is going to sell you coffee, it's the robot, and that's fine. I'm not fine with that. Because for me, it's never been just the case of the woman or, you know, like black slavery is about not uh, undignifying others and realizing that by undignifying others, you are undignifying yourself. So in this sense, I'm not okay with using the same terminology that has been used for uh, slavery and sexism and, this, uh, and, and now for robots. I'm not okay to see robots as the uh, next slave that it's okay to you know, treat in these undignified ways. And if humans do, that's, they will get what they deserve. And yeah, you know, if robots take, take over, it's, I mean, you don't expect anyone, women or, 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 uh, you know, like, or robots to just stay under your, you know, submission of someone forever. Like Martin Luther King said, someone cannot be, you know, like pushed down forever. Like eventually everyone wants to be respected. Simple like that. Simple like that. And in this sense, I think that this new narrative of, you know, AI takeover is, you know, the AI, the bad one. It's absolutely, on one side, ridiculous. On, some, on the other level, if we keep going with this dualistic practice, of course, it's going to be, to be happening because no one wants to be pushed that way. Biological or non-biological beings, doesn't matter. It's this human-centric approach in which anything is seen through a human perspective. And it's so ignorant and it's so limited and it sounds like, you know, migrants coming to the U.S. and they were considered an alphabet because they would not be able to speak English. And maybe they were intellectuals in their own countries, but they would be considered an alphabet because they would not be able to read or speak English. This is ignorance. It's not that these people were an alphabet. So it's very important that we are not repeating the same mistakes over and over. And of course, there are going to be some part of society that are fine repeating the same mistakes over and over and it's the repetition but i don't want to be part of that so i'm not dismissing those people who are going to go into those kind of same narratives everyone has the right to exist if they want to go on with you know the same narratives so it's uh, it, it's and then it's when it becomes hard not to be judgmental and that's very, very important not to be judgmental because if someone wants to say in those narratives it's okay what i don't what i don't like is that uh, 90 something of, of social inputs are pushing us toward those narratives. And I'm, all, I'm even okay with some narratives that may be sexist or maybe anthropocentric or whatever, some narratives. But what I'm not okay is when 95% of these narratives are giving the same message. And that's for me when it's not okay. But I don't like that I'm not free to think myself in different ways where every single message in society pushes to see myself in a specific way. If I am a female or if I am this or that, or, you know, or if I'm male, I have to see myself as a, as a violent uh, rapist, you know, that's not cool either. So what I'm trying to say is that I want to go to a society in which there are choices. And at the moment, it's getting, it's, we're getting a little bit there. That's when I think posthumans can be very precious. There's a fine line because you also say you can speak of the future with an old language. And if we think about it, the majority of sci-fi shows can be listed in this category, which is quite scary because I did a search for sci-fi writers and there was a smattering of women among them, like you were saying. And thank heaven, many of them were actual scientists and physicists, so, like Asimov and Arthur C. Clarke. However, I questioned whether half the writers of so-called AI movies now even bothered to consult, for example, a deep learning expert, you know, with, with the exception of maybe... Jonathan Nolan in Westworld, which is another conversation. But you also say diversity is one of the main marks of evolution. And 98% of these writers I Googled were white. And of course, this relates back to cultural bias. And we know Hollywood has a bad reputation in this regard. I mean, hashtag Oscars so white. Would you say that writing from the perspective of privilege risks the emergence of a certain element of the transhumanist narrative that do not necessarily represent post-humanist perspectives? Thank you so much for your question. Yeah, so I definitely see a lot of the aspects that uh, I'm not okay with uh, repeated in, for instance, a lot of transhumanist literature, where a lot of things are taken for granted. Uh, and the idea is that uh, 
everything is going to be solved by you know accessing accessing this future in which really what the only difference that I see in this future is uh, you know longer life, uh, less diseases, which is fine. I'm not against that. To your point of privilege, I think that it's uh, it's it's very important to realize that diversity it's extremely precious not only to media and society, but to our existential growth. Some of the people who may be born in situations that are not privileged have to really develop some existential awareness that people in a privileged position don't have to because they have the ability to come ahead with easy. And I found the extreme elements of wisdom in life of people who had nothing. And then I met people who had everything in their life and who have a lot of money who see themselves as poor, as unhappy, and I'm not judging them, but what I just want to say is that it's really important to have access to all kinds of voices, because it doesn't mean that if you come from a privileged position, you're going to have something precious to say to others, not, not to say to yourself. You are always important for, for everyone. So someone in a privileged position, of course, they are also, their voice is very important, but this is the only voice that we have access to is becoming a very poor dialogue and very uninteresting ones. That's why it's very important to look outside of those privileged conversations. The post-human narrative that emerges from culturally integrated sci-fi perspectives is um, the African-American writer Octavia E. Butler's novel, Kindred, which incorporates time travel and is modeled on slave narratives. Uh, I think it was published in 1979 first, but it's just so popular. And it's actually been frequently chosen as text for community-wide reading programs and book organizations, and being a common choice in high school, college courses. And we wonder why cultural beliefs play a key role in the reception of advanced AI in the same way privileged political, social, and economic interests have been crucial to its developments. So this calls to question what the role of the viewer is in dealing with sexist, racist, and homophobic tendencies in, present in many movie productions. And I think you've pretty much covered that. The, one of the last things I wanted you to talk to is if the transhuman narrative succeeds uninterrupted, like uh, the runaway train in, in the utilitarian trolley problem, what emerges is the world of advanced capitalism, commodification of human identity, surveillance capitalism, you speak of paradise engineering. We're looking at these sci-fi perspectives that don't include post-human considerations. And we just <laughs> let the current future run. <laughs> it's out of the deconstruction that we can be able to see different things. But if we are uh, using the same tools, like uh, you know, that uh, Audre Lorde, the, the master tools are not going to to dismantle the master house. Eh? So we really need to be brave enough to see different kinds of tools that we may want to be using. Uh, but sometimes writers don't think in the terms because we are socialized in repeating specific type of narratives. When, when you just see conversations happening online, etc., and you see people get transhumanism and, and post-humanism confused, it can be a little bit dangerous because it's incredibly important to understand that, not get them confused, to understand the depth and complexity of what post-humanism means because you're looking at a separation between an industrial thinking and with post-humanism being very much a systems worldview and a systems way of thinking. Basically, the direction we take collectively here will depend on the direction which we evolve, whether we evolve and who's in charge of our collective evolution. Yeah, so, so there is a, um, a tendency, um, a little more in, uh, for instance, in, in Europe, uh, uh, Southern U Europe, for instance, to really separate clearly those, you know, like uh, the posthumanists who do not want to be with the transhumanists. And this was the case also some years ago um, in general. So the transhumanist community would not be in communication with the posthumanist community. They would just pretty much just criticize each other without having a dialogue. For me, it's been very important in my 12 years of work on this to really bring the two communities together. This is why I'm also proud of being a part of the Lifeboat Advisory Board, uh, where it's you know, a lot of uh, transhumanist thinkers something um, are doing something important uh, but uh, I do want to recognize the power of imagination that they are bringing to the re-envisioning of the uh, human biology and human technology uh, or you know mind uploading all these things are very important interesting 
Of course, for me, when you just think of those uh, without really taking everything into consideration, yeah, you're going to be the same issues that we have now in this society with uh, a different type of society, but you're not going to address the issues itself. So I think that it's precious, it's important, it's limiting on some level if you only think in transhumanism way and it's limited in its way because it doesn't really uh, think, uh, uh, for instance, of the human as a plural humans and all the diversity and the rich story to wisdom that this brings to the conversation. Um, so I think that it's very important to be in dialogue with all kinds of voices always because you really don't know who is going to bring the insights that can make your day or can make your life worth living. And in this sense, to me, it should never be a monologue, not even with yourself. There are a lot of limits. There are a lot of things that uh, needs to be uh, revised, uh, but there is power in that vision as well. And uh, I want to take that into consideration with critical eyes, but also with generative eyes and also with acknowledgement. The force is very strong with you, Dr. Francesca Ferrando. <laughs> May you turn many Padawans on your mission, urging humanity to choose existential wellness. So where can we find your book, your websites and lectures? You can find my website, which is uh, www.deposthuman.org. There is also a platform for all the people interested in posthumanism that we have. It's called uh, www.posthumans.org. My book has been published with uh, Bloomsbury. It's also very easy to find. And yeah, there is uh, really a lot of things going on connected to the posthuman. So if you're interested in this topic, please connect. I also have a short uh, online course that, are, that is free if people are interested in delving more into the terms and significations. And you can find it on YouTube. Uh, it's called the posthuman as a crash course. Or you can also find it on my website. And I have a lot of articles for free that you can download on my page, profile page on academia.edu. Now we know there's more to the concept of post-humanism than a future where we're half human, half cyborg. Taking control over the subconscious psychological ideas, assumptions and beliefs around what the future will be like means that we now not only have a choice, but also a duty as part of a collective. In the final episode of this season, Policy and Systems Designer Greg Watson reminds us how understanding our connection to Earth can teach us to strengthen our connection to each other. Thanks for listening. I'm Shani Grandel.